Many a metagame has become famous for revolving around a Pokemon that is broken. Yet for one reason or another, the tier is better off with it around, creating a balance of sorts, not dissimilar to how Ubers generally works in more modern gens. But that doesn't mean the effects of that Pokemon's brokenness aren't thoroughly felt. Something like GSC Snorlax or RBY Tauros are more obvious examples, but one could certainly cite Black and White Latios. Arguments could be made for Advanced Tyranitar or Skarmory or DPP Jirachi or many Pokemon in Gen 9 OU. Pretty much Every Uber's metagame has Pokemon like this, and many lower tiers do as well. These are well known. So this video is about the opposite. Metagames that revolve around certain Pokemon that are without the off-maligned broken factor, which often contributes to the stifling, frustrating feeling of having to compromise yourself to deal with unnecessary evil. So for a nice change of pace from our familiar routine of measuring brokenness, we're exploring five metagames that revolve around Pokemon that aren't broken. But first, once again, this video is sponsored by Raycon. Look, everyday tasks can be super tedious. Make them more seamless by listening to your favorite audio while doing these tasks through the best earbuds in the high quality audio business. I use the everyday earbuds literally every day for many tasks. I use them while I wash dishes and cook. I use them while I edit. And of course, I use them while exercising. One of the best features of the new everyday earbuds is that they're sweat resistant. So I don't have to worry when I use them to listen to music or audiobooks while I exercise. And speaking of audiobooks, I listen to a ton of them while I do tasks. It's how I absorb knowledge while I have to do chores. I'm always hustling, be it with content or working on other ventures, so I want to absorb as much knowledge as possible. In fact, I listen to so much stuff that you'd think I'd run out of earbud battery quickly. But luckily, yet another one of my favorite features of Raycon, its battery life, comes in handy here because it has a whopping 32-hour battery life, and it's got a quick charge function. 10 minutes of charging gives me 90 minutes of battery, and of course, it's always been a pain to connect to other wireless Bluetooth devices to multiple devices. But luckily with Raycon, I can simply connect them to two devices at once. So what are you waiting for? Increase your everyday productivity and go to buyraycon.com FSG to get 20 to 50% off site-wide. And thank you so much to Raycon for sponsoring this video. We're kicking things off with the combination that inspired this video. Excadrill and Clefable have been defining Oras for many years at this point. The Pokemon that follow them most closely may shift fairly regularly, but Excadrill and Clefable run the table. However, you could not, under any circumstance, consider either of them broken. Well, unless you're one of those people that think all Oras games end in Combine Clefable Wars, but it's long since been demonstrated that this is false, and that finding Clefable broken is simply a skill issue. Thankfully, most people don't buy into such outdated propaganda anymore anyway. They simply know Excadrill and Clefable as the excellent utility Pokemon they are, and that's exactly what makes the case so interesting. It's not even like the tier is most strongly defined by a powerful yet not broken offensive threat, as many of our other examples are. No, these two are splashable and ranked first and second in the tier because of pure utility. Sure, they can dip into offensive guises, Excadrill can drop his usual Mold Breaker for Sand Rush, and even Swords Dance when paired with Tyranitar or Hippowdon, while Clefable can run quite an offensive Life Orb set. However, these variants are not their most defining that fully take advantage of the utility the player base most often employs them for. And even still, these variants do still have this utility. The dynamic originated from Excadrill being a superb answer to Clefable's Stealth Rock, Thunder Wave, and Moonblast centric game. Not only could Excadrill soak these attacks up easily, its stab Iron Head was one of the few attacks in the game that actually immediately threatened Clefable in return. It was exceedingly rare for Pokemon that threatened big damage on Clefable to be so comfortable switching into it. Additionally, Excadrill was the only truly competent rapid spinner in a tier famous for its dearth of effective hazard removal and the resultant spikes domination, with its ability to provide crucial breathing room against the otherwise oppressive forces of Clefable and Spikes. Exodrill quickly shot through the ranks, especially because its auspicious typing allowed it so many opportunities to switch in and itself to set up Stealth Rock. Or as OU has no shortage of threats, and indeed many of them also pack a great deal of utility. Superior, Tornado Sterian, Rotom Wash, Volcanion, but they aren't quite as elite in warping the demands placed on the tier as Excadrill and Clefable. If you want to use hazards, you've got to consider how you're going to handle the Excadrill rapid spin threat. While Clefable is one of the most unwavering defensive forces against both direct and especially indirect damage alike, the indirect damage aspect of the tier is so crucial, and these two play such major roles in it, that they have completely made Oraz OU about them more than anything else, more than any Mega even.
Next, we're jumping into a double feature of two tiers defined by a trio of tough to take on menaces. Now, none of these Pokemon are without their share of controversy. In fact, all three face intense scrutiny and dislike from many of the player base in Gen 7. Complaints about Lando T's abundant usage are internal, but they peaked at a point in Gen 7 where it genuinely had over 70% usage in high level tournaments, leading some to question how healthy its presence was. Additionally, Z Heatran was infuriatingly difficult to counter and was the closest of the three to being considered considered genuinely broken, while Toxapex had no shortage of hatred towards its playstyle either, given that it was seemingly designed to have everything it did be as irritating as possible. However, even at their strongest, these three were never truly busted, and only became more manageable with time, allowing them to illustrate the concept at hand. In both Gen 7 and 8, these three are excellent for their offensive and defensive capability. Yes, even Toxapex the wall is quite threatening. It won't be dishing out massive direct damage, but it sure packs the tools. Scald, Toxic, and Knockoff to make plenty of good Pokemon run from it. The same dynamic applies to defensive versions of Heatran and Landorus Tyrion, with Pokemon that possess such excellent range, both in terms of being able to switch in against such large portions of the metagame, and being able to use those switch-in opportunities to bring the pain against opponents in return. They are naturally going to fit on an incredibly high number of teams that want to use their many talents and are commonly paired together. However, they differ from, say, the Toral Snorlax Chansey Triangle of RBY as one example, because they are not broadly unstoppable for much of the metagame, nor are they borderline irreplaceable in what they do. As excellent as they are, they aren't even close to overwhelming in either regard, let alone both. And yet, despite not possessing true broken status, the metagame does indeed largely revolve around them, precisely because of this wide reach. A major threat of specially defensive Gliscor's strength in Gen 7 is that it does well against all of them, and its absence is significantly felt in Gen 8, which has to adopt other measures that aren't nearly as resilient against the status these Pokemon like to dish out. You see a lot of Landorus Wars as a result, with the removal of hidden power meaning the two threaten each other much less instantly and can no longer play a game of chicken with HP Ice. Lando T has long since been the gold standard for physical attackers to have to deal with it if they must be successful, and indeed the best physical attackers in the tier are those that aren't as threatened by it. For instance, Weavile in Gen 8 and Kartana in both gens. Lando T's also adopted the specially defensive variant to act as a sort of new glass score, extending its defensive reach even further, demanding greater power from the meta at large to break through it on both sides of the spectrum. Of course, when it comes to taking hits on both sides of the spectrum, one need not look further than the eternal, unkillable Toxapex and its peerless ability to effortlessly withstand repeated assaults. Alongside its status and knockoff heavy assault, it forces most teams, even more offensive ones, to slow their game down, because overpowering it before it can mess with you is near impossible for all, but the most out and out aggressive teams like the famous German offense. Heatran commands a similar level of respect and response in the team builder despite not having near Toxapex's level of longevity, owning to its terrific bulk and typing, packing an embarrassment of riches as far as resistances are concerned. In return, it provides both a Pex-esque bombardment of status as well as more directly ferocious offense without even trying. We haven't even mentioned the hazard support these Pokemon provide, making their placement on teams even more essential. Landl T and Heatran are famously among the game's best stealth rockers, while Toxapex Texas Toxic Spikes plague many an affected Pokemon. It's worth mentioning that these two metagames are also strongly influenced by other Pokemon they both pack, which are not quite broken. But Fable, Tornado Styrian, Garchomp, Ferrothor, and Kartana, though there's sometimes some concern over Kartana. However, the Lando Trend Pex Triangle is a perfect example of a metagame, or in this case, metagames, revolving around Pokemon which are superb yet not broken. This one's kind of controversial, because all three Pokemon have been complained about by certain aspects of the player base at one point in time or another, but ultimately, they have not been deemed broken. Yet the influence they exert over the tier with their power is utterly massive. Near the end of current gen Black and White 2, some players decided Drudagon's so-called perfection and how it was so good at fulfilling so many different roles, damage dealing, utility, a mix of both, that it could be slapped on every single team without detriment, what would you use over it anyway? Now this was a slight exaggeration, and Drud 
Predagon did not quite become Gen 5 Aryu's GSC Snorlax, but it is indeed a massive influence on the tier, not actually broken so much as spammable a la Lander Hysterion. On the other hand, most recent years have seen Moltres and Durant come under some reasonable fire. It's not just because of their immense power. Yes, they are incredibly strong. What bothers some players is the RNG aspect. It's not the accuracy woes of Hurricane and Hustle. It's more of the secondary effects. Moltres' Hurricane can miss 30% of the time, but it also has a 30% confusion rate, which then gives a 50% chance you'll hit yourself. Meanwhile, Durant's 80% accurate Iron Head also packed a 30% flinch rate. A Pokemon this strong could take away your ability to move even just once, you could very well be completely out of luck in a late game scenario. However, these RNG scenarios, though frustrating, were low percentage, and beyond that, it was difficult to truly make a case for their brokenness. Between Moltres' famous stealth rock weakness alongside a speed stat that was good but not blowing away anyone, while Durant was faster and more resilient to passive damage, while also got knocked over by a light breeze if it came off of a special attack stat, and had to deal with the many woes of physical attackers like Scald, Intimidate, and Rocky Helmet. Ultimately, other than unfortunate instances of Pokemon being too RNG heavy for players' liking, what held these back from brokenness was that they were not automatic win machines that carried worse players to victory through the sheer power of the buttons they mashed freely and without thought to consequence. Instead, you had a different dynamic, specifically that hinges on the potential excellence of these Pokemon should they be wielded well. The tier revolved around these three yes, and they were capable of incredible performances, but the onus was on their user to extract maximum value. Even the wall smash Dredagon constantly had to be careful of its paltry speed stat, or even the fact that it wasn't going to have an easy time against defense, even if its moveset was geared towards such an end. It was going to have to hit a Lomomola with Thunder Punch on the switch, because otherwise it'd have to run from the one-on-one, -on -one, and for that matter, it needed some chip damage racked up on a Lomomola first, too. This was just the beginning, too. Now, these weren't Herculean tasks, so they were hardly unreasonable demands, but you couldn't pull this off mindlessly. If you could, great. You would reap the rewards of a truly gifted wall breaker. If not, you'd be just as hapless as if you hadn't brought anything of the sort. Of course, it did place great demands on opponents, both in terms of defending against its onslaught and in breaking through its defensive variants, given its great resistant bulk. This is why it's so spammable and so defining. However, it didn't overwhelm while doing so. In a similar vein, Moltres and Durant had spectacular crushing power that little could stand up to safely. Durant's high speed meant it was lights out late game, hustle willing anyway, once checks like Quillfish and and Boar had been worn down. Meanwhile, Moltres was nearly impossible to straight up counter with its gigantic stabs plowing through just about everything. However, they weren't automatic. Even the less obviously flawed Durant is not putting well-built teams into unreasonably difficult positions and even has matchups where its choice sets can't click their stabs lest they get trapped by Magneton. As a result, despite the rockier aspects of these three, they define the metagame without beginning a cascading chain of broken checking Pokemon. Okay, this might sound insane, but hear us out. Yes, Ubers is by definition a parade of broken monsters crashing into each other, and even there is a balance to be found in it. It's still not exactly balanced in the sense that other tiers aim for. However, we wanted to see if there was a metagame where the concept of this video applies, and we believe Gen 4 Ubers is the candidate. Every generation afterwards, you got outrageously overwhelming Pokemon, starting with Arcus being fully unleashed, and being followed by monsters like Primal Groudon, Zacian Crown, Maridon and Karidon, etc. In the generations before, you still got some absurdly broken monsters that warped the meta to obscene extents. Gen 1 Mewtwo, Gen 2 Snorlax, and in Gen 3, you have both Laddie Twins. In Gen 4 though, there's a balance. Sure, you've got the crazy level of power more characteristic of later generations. Specs Kyogre and Draco Meteor, yes, yes. However, with Arceus being ousted from the tier, you don't have anything truly mandatory or meta-shattering in the way other generations do. As strong as the power level is, the Pokemon the tier revolves around are, stunningly, not really broken. You can throw Dialga and Giratina Origin on pretty much any team. Kyogre is the only quote-unquote limited in that it can't fit on dedicated Sun teams using Pokemon like Heatran and Cresselia, but otherwise it's up there with them. All three possess an incredible amount of offensive defensive utility. However, of the three, Dialga's ability to help against Kyogre, as well as its unique role as a dragon type not weak to dragon or ice for that matter, thus helping combat the tier's plentiful dragon spam and its access to stealth rock means it is out and out the most splashable and it does this without a hint of brokenness in any regard its defensive presence is very strong but it's not immortal even if it slots in protect for extra leftovers recovery the reason its support set is so 
spammable is because it's a great temporary answer to a lot of major threats. It won't perma wall Kyogre, but it sure does switch in nicely for a while. Its Choice Scarf set is also an excellent check to an enormous portion of the offensive metagame, but it couldn't be further from broken. It's got this capability to destroy any wall with offensive sets, but that's hardly unique to Ubers, and its speed holds it back. Thus, you have a pure example of this concept. The Pokemon the tier most revolves around is the ultimate utility, nothing that could be considered broken in any sense. It fits perfectly into the tier's power dynamic, and in fact, one of the most crucial parts in holding it together. Together. The best part? It's far from mandatory. You want to spam Dialga for its Landry's steering esque glue factor, but you don't need it to not collapse to the tier's threats. Origin is much the same. Yes, it's a great wall breaker, and being the best spin blocker in the game, of course, makes it the most natural partner for many spike stacking teams that define the tier, from Deoxys speed to Skarmory, with said spikes making it even more difficult to answer. However, its speed, in addition to its commonly targeted dragon and ice weaknesses, means it's hardly bowling over the whole tier. Why then is Gary? Giratina O oh, so spammable. Because, like Dialga, it's a fantastic check to so much of the metagame. It's got superb bulk alongside a uniquely valuable set of resistances and immunities, which notably includes Levitate, affording it the immunity to not just Earthquake, but also to Spikes itself, which more than makes up for its lack of leftovers recovery by ensuring it was always staying at high enough health to make the most of that impressive hit taking bulk. Additionally, its stab Grisius or boosted Shadow State was amazing priority for picking up all manner of weakened faster threats, especially the Laddie Twins and Mewtwo that were so weak to it. So once again, though Giratina Origin was a massive threat, it was far from broken, and in fact cries for the stabilizing effect it brought to its team. Okay, those two are fine, but King Kyogre? How is that one not busted? Of course, this is one that comes the closest. But even the big whale doesn't throttle the tier on the scale of what one would expect from the biggest and baddest uber among ubers. It is a monstrous threat, of course, from Specs to Scarf to Calm Mind to Thunder Wave. However, several factors hold it back from being overwhelming, barely able to be contained. First, it's fun to cite Specs Water Spout to it KOing Blissey, but the fact of the matter is that the fast-paced Uber's metagame means it's difficult for Kyogre to stay at super high health. Additionally, it's not just checked by Blissey, it's checked by Soldu Latios and Palkia, both of which can switch into Specs Water Spout and threaten it. It's not just Specs Ogre either, and as a result, the presence of Dialga and Latios gets the job done. As does out offensing it with strong, faster pressure, which is quite feasible when considering how Kyogre is not exactly impervious to opposing attacks, especially on the physical side, and how it is hit well by every form of entry hazards, and that just like the other two, it is not exactly the fastest thing around. This is not to say nothing of other counters like Quagsire and Ludicolo popping up either. Playing around Kyogre is more or less like any other big uber's threat. Dangerous, sure, and you'll sometimes lose a Pokemon to its sheer power, but it's nothing too out of the ordinary given the tier. You'll dance around it not just with its dedicated checks, but with other Pokemon like Rayquaza or the aforementioned Giratina Origin. Really, the only potentially truly overbearing part of Kyogre is how its drizzle might unleash a swift swimmer on you later on. And even that isn't anything Ubers can't handle between Priority, Groudon, Airlock Rayquaza, or just general hit taking. As a result, the three most defining Pokemon in DPP Ubers winds up creating a tier that is balanced around them without veering into truly broken territory. Amazing, considering it's Ubers, and almost surely the only such Uber tier to turn out that way. Okay, here we have a Pokemon that is a GSC Snorlax of sorts. Every serious advanced UU team should have Kangaskhan. Whether it's the most fast-paced hyper offense or the slowest, bulkiest hardcore stall, there's nowhere Kangaskhan doesn't not only fit, but excel. It can and does do it all at the highest level. You can't replace it with anything that wouldn't be a worse option. You don't drop Kangaskhan because, well, what else would you use instead? And yet Kangaskhan isn't broken. It's the only mandatory mon in any of the tiers mentioned today yet it is hardly breaking its tier. Indeed, Gen 3 UU is famously praised for its balance, much like GSC OU and its mandatory Snorlax. Except even the most diehard GSC fan won't hesitate to say that, of course, Lax is crazy busted. Kangaskhan, on the other hand, not so much. Sure, it's an excellent Pokemon that takes on a huge portion of the tier, it's difficult to switch into, it's not threatened by much, and a few Pokemon that actively scare it don't like switching into it, so it's pretty easy to pivot out of its more passive, much less immediately dangerous checks like Cradilly. 
However, its power is not so great as to be all-consuming. It's strong, but its attack stat is not exactly insane. It's bulky, but hardly immovable, especially with spikes in play. Its speed isn't anything to write home about. It commands the opponent to play carefully around its barrage of attacks. Pivoting into its non-normal stab is a common tactic and to limit its free turns, but it isn't instantly bowling through entire teams either. That's in its more offensive guises too. Defensive Kangaskhan is great, but it's hardly Giratina, and its wish-passing techniques are hardly reinforcing teams is on the level of a Loma Mola. This is not to downplay how great Kangaskhan is though. There's a reason Kangaskhan mirrors are fairly common. They often end in an HP Ice Lando T-esque fashion, where both exchange a hit, then retreat on the following turn. Except here it's more essential because Kangaskhan can generally be quite a pain to take down with its single fighting weakness in a tier, not overflowing with power. Though that's not to say Kangaskhan can't be hit for great damage by Pokemon like Choice Band Scyther and Rain Dance Omastar. That's exactly why it fits so perfectly for this video though. Advanced UU is literally Kangaskhan the tier, and yet for all the metagame machinations surrounding its power, it's not broken. In conclusion, though it's well known that there are many crazy broken Pokemon smashing into broken metagames out there, and not just Ubers, there are many others that revolve around certain Pokemon without those pokes being explicitly busted, showing that there will always be top dogs, which people get sick of eventually, even if they aren't broken. The metagames we've selected are certain cases, but there are of course many, many others. We could have happily selected Orazuyu or DPP Little Cup, for example. Let us know which metagames you'd pick and which Pokemon they revolve around, and if you agree or disagree with any of the metagames we've presented here and we'll see you next time thanks for watching everyone and as always if you like the video and you want to see more be sure to subscribe to false swipe gaming for more weekly pokemon content and thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos and thank you to everyone else watching as well And thank you so much to our Platinum Patrons. Thank you to Amphozenus, Alex Sable, Anthony Belval Renault, Bingleton, Daniel Isbees, Dr. Mint, Funky, Glitcherton, Gustavo, Hal, Nurse Jake, Jack G, Lord of the Rabbit, Pretzel SP, Raven Daytona Ring, Ray Ray, Skylaria, Soros and Croxon, Shiwe Miji, Stoneface Colin, and Quetzalcoatl Northropi for their major support of our videos and follow my crew on these social media platforms. And that's all I got. See you next time, everyone.